A whole new global talk show, news tellers. Let's meet our panellists. Are there any recent news stories that have been gaining particular interest in your countries these days? Well, in Spain they are talking about terrorism all the time and okay. uh, the possibility that we, we can have some uh, risk. And our elections that they are going to be held on December 20th okay. and the government is going to totally change. What about you guys? The issue of gun violence in the U.S. has mm -hmm. yet again made the headlines with a shooting in Colorado at a, at a family planning center and of course whenever these kind of incidents happen. You have calls from both sides to either restrict gun usage or mm. make guns, you know, more available. And unfortunately, everyone forgets about it after a few weeks. In France, same as Spain, we still like terror attacks mm. and the consequences and the aftermath are really the main uh, topic of all the news in the, in the media. Um, and how should France react after the attack? A lot mm -hmm. of debates going on. Well, as I've said in recent weeks, Canada has a new prime minister. Yeah. He's a young and handsome guy, so everybody's really interested in what he does. He's a lot more charismatic than the previous leaders. He recently made his first trip abroad to Paris to participate in the climate conference, and so everyone was very interested and watched what he did very closely. Okay. And are there any particular news stories in Korea that you guys are interested in? Um, actually, I'm currently writing a feature about the um, green policies of Seoul. Okay. It turned out that Seoul have very interesting, uh, very successful green policies. Maybe we can talk more about it later. Indeed, indeed. I'm happy with an article that I had just published in a magazine about a renovated Hanok, a, a traditional Korean home. Okay. And it had very nice pictures that accompanied it. It's uh, published in the December-January issue of Monocle magazine. And uh, so far, I've, uh, I've gotten some good feedback from it. Nice. They're getting more popular these days. Okay. Yeah, there's some, some really interesting architects out there who uh, are taking these old, somewhat dilapidated homes and kind of putting a new modern spin on it, and they look really nice. I didn't know you were working for real estate catalogs, but <laughs> <laughs> very, very nice work, man. I can, maybe I can help get you a good deal on a Hano catalog. Okay. Yeah. All right, well, shall we get into today's topics? Uh, Fred alluded to the first one earlier, actually. Mm -hmm. We're going to be talking about climate change and golf in South Korea. Now, on News Tellers, we talk a lot about issues that relate to Korea. Uh, but there are certain issues that need to be tackled by the global community. We're going to discuss the big global issue, which is pretty hot right now, climate change. Yes. So let's take a look at this video. Oscar-winning filmmaker Charles Ferguson's documentary, Time to Choose, was screened at the UN Climate Change Conference in Paris. The documentary revealed the stark reality of rising global temperatures and raised awareness about the seriousness of climate change. Meanwhile, movie star Leonardo DiCaprio took part in a captivating documentary exploring the dangers of climate change. We face a convergence of crises, all of which are a concern for life. Following the 2007 production of 11th Hour, DiCaprio teamed up with the Discovery Channel for a new show called Ecotown. So it's not just scientists, environmentalists that are trying to raise global awareness about climate change now, it's the film industry as well. So have any of you seen uh, this documentary Time to Choose or the Leonardo DiCaprio produced The 11th Hour? Well, I saw the 11th hour and I think it's, it's a little bit apocalyptic, okay. but it's good to raise the awareness about climate change. Yeah, same, it's time for choose. I mean, first it's uh, done by a very good director, mm -hmm. director from it, um, No End in Sight, it was a very good documentary. Right. Uh, and what's interesting about this movie is that he went to a lot of different places in the world and he, there is beautiful um, photography, mm -hmm. beautiful images, and as well very scary images. He went to places where you can see how we are destroying our environment. You can see the pollution in Indonesia, in China. Mm -hmm. And the interesting thing about this movie as well is that not only it shows the problems, but it brings some solutions, some ideas, things that could be done. So 
uh, it's good to have a little bit of hope mm -hmm. when you see these movies as well. Okay. I'm glad Leo is still getting work these days. Uh, <laughs> some of his best work is behind him. Basketball Diaries, What's Eating Gilbert Grape. But uh, climate change is now becoming a call celeb. And I think this is a good thing at the moment. I mean, it needs to have more awareness. And to reach the masses, you need to have a celebrity like DiCaprio mm -hmm. out there and advocating for it. Of course, you know, the real, the, the, the most monumental documentary up until this time about climate change was Al Gore's An Inconvenient Truth that came yeah. out a little over a decade ago. Uh, it was dry, perhaps, but it started to raise awareness. But now that you have kind of, let's say, more high profile, popular cultural uh, symbols like Leonardo uh, out there and, and calling for change and raising red flags about uh, what man is doing to the environment. Uh, hopefully that can gain more traction. Indeed. I can mention about uh, initiative, uh, another interesting initiative as well. The, ten years ago there was a movie director who made, you know, the, um, this movie about penguins? Uh, oh, March a, of the Penguins. Oh, yeah. The March of the Penguins. That movie is mm. awesome. That movie is really good. And good. this guy, ten years after, he came back to the same place where he shot the movies. And I was listening on coming to this show today on the podcast and he was saying, it's changing. Uh, right. I can see ten years after that the, the environment there, there is less ice and it's changing. It's very striking to see that on, in only ten years you can already see the effect of global warming. This is for all the global warming deniers that still exist. Indeed, indeed. <laughs> so that's important. Yet. Well, I think the deniers are a smaller and smaller group all the time. And you know, a, a word that's popped up in our conversation a lot so far is awareness. And awareness is, of course, important. but. I think we're at a point now where we need to really start taking actual action mm. beyond just being aware. But I, I, I would say, like I've said this before, uh, consensus is a hugely important thing in, in politics and in, in society. So uh, I think it is important to build some kind of consensus that climate change is a real problem and does need a, a real response. Okay, so let's talk about action and uh, how climate change relates to politics then. Um, it's a big issue in American politics right now, especially President Obama's ambitious climate initiative called the Clean Power Plan has met strong opposition from the Republican Party, not surprising, um, but it's also a matter of great importance amongst the presidential candidates as well. Uh, so how big is the issue in your respective countries and what strategies are in place to tackle climate change? Well, it's a big issue in Canada because, you know, Canada is this big, you know, resource rich, uh, naturally beautiful country. And um, there, there's also a very big fossil fuel industry. So like, right. there, for several years, there's been this big conversation about like, you know, do we need to continue propping up the fossil fuel industry and allow like this particular part of the, uh, the province of Alberta in particular to, that, that had this huge economic boom for years. There was really high rates of economic growth. That's all really tailing off now. And I do think that, uh, Public opinion in, in Canada, I think, is shifting in favor of uh, cutting emissions and being more of a leader on this issue and, and leading a, a global consensus on the necessity of cutting carbon emissions. Okay, so some hope there. In Spain, we are not doing bad. Um, we don't have as uh, much emissions as uh, other countries with the same population. For example, Korea has 50 million people, same as Spain, mm -hmm. and we have like uh, half of emissions. We have been working in um, renewable energies for a long time. We have a yeah. lot of sun and wind. So I guess we are doing okay. We are, doing, we are uh, meeting more or less the standards that the European Union uh, sets. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, we will try to make it better in the future. Yeah, s s same with France. Same, uh, France has, is one of the lowest uh, gas emitter among developed countries. Right. Uh, the reason is because we are nuclear, uh, our nuclear industry is huge, so mm -hmm. we don't produce so much CO2. Uh, and France as well, I mean, now that the COP21 conference is in Paris for like the last, last year, there was this huge uh, diplomatic drive to try to bring all the countries on, bro on board right. and so to try to make the country pledge a reduction of um, gar carbon. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so far, that's what France is doing. Uh, just to go back, what you mentioned, uh, Su Jung, about uh, the, the climate change debate that's happening in the US, I really don't think there are many other developed countries especially the, the, the world's number one economy where there is such a divide 
over, you know, the, is climate change real? And mm. it's so obvious, it's down ideological lines. You have one party with, you know, that is more linked to big business saying that climate change doesn't exist. You have politicians bringing snowballs onto the floor of Congress to show that there is no such thing as global warming. Uh, it's and, amazing to watch. I'm and not in as a good ambitious sense. as President Obama has been about uh, climate change, unfortunately, depending on the outcome of the 2016 election, whatever is agreed upon now, and there's no sign of anything domestically being passed through the Republican controlled Congress, it could all be. Uh, you know, overturned mm. if a Republican does get into the White House. Uh, so un unfortunately, yeah, there's, even though America should be at the forefront of reducing uh, mankind's environmental impact, uh, it's so stuck up in all these bizarre political fighting. So let's talk about the uh, international agreements then. Yeah. Um, I mean, a lot of nations are being put under pressure to reduce their greenhouse gases. Um, so how can countries go about doing this, whether it's voluntary or compulsory? Well, I think everybody has to uh, understand that, that we are in the 21st century and, uh, and, and developing doesn't need to uh, uh, be through uh, carbon emissions. I mean, you, you can develop like really new uh, renewable energies, you can de develop nuclear energy with the latest technologies that is safe and clean and also you can make a really huge and new business with uh, electric and hydrogen vehicles. So it's just changing our focus, it's just changing our mind about how development is and, and, and how should we promote that development. Well, anybody who's seen the picture photos of Beijing recently, yeah. I mean, if there's not a, if there's any stronger endorsement of the need to act on carbon emissions, I mean. Well, you know, of course, but the difference between the U.S. and China is that people in the U.S. will, but unfortunately, it'll probably come too late. But as sea levels rise, as more super storms hit parts of the U.S., you'll have more public outcry mm. that will hopefully lead to political change. However, in China, where there have been protests about environmental damage, they've usually been you know, forcefully put down by the government. So there's right. that kind of accountability, let's say, in China doesn't exist. But the problem is, it will be too late. Uh, oh, there is yeah, such really. inertia that once you, when you already have the catastrophe and the superstorm, it's already too late, too late to change the course back. It's, um, Indeed. I think it will take some big emergencies in order <laughs> yeah. to get the world moving. So whether countries take strict measures or not, I think there's no denying that this is a big problem. Um, but do you see it more as an opportunity rather than a crisis? Are we going to see a new phase of new energy sources? I mean, we can have hope. Uh, as I said in the introduction, um, mm. I interviewed recently the mayor of Seoul, Park Won Soon, and that was really interesting. I realized that, uh, I didn't know, but in three years, Seoul managed to reduce its consumption of energy by the equivalent of one nuclear power plant. In oh, only wow. three years, it's impressive. Uh, like making every world, everybody involved, all the citizens, partic they, they participate to this like self, uh, the program of reducing by yourself your consumption by using more uh, public transportation. Mm. Uh, they managed to convince a lot of people using very small incentives, but these small incentives are enough for people to to participate to this uh, this program. And now Seoul City wants to reduce its consumption by the equivalent of two nuclear power plants. And a lot of cities around Korea are trying to follow this model, and I, I find it pretty, pretty interesting. That's great. I mean, I think to a degree, the market has to lead the way. I mean, I think governments are responsible in setting up these conditions, incentives, and all, make it attractive for people or, to, or businesses to consume less energy, and that will hopefully make the difference. Okay, so Seoul's doing pretty well, um, but we do need to find. I mean, it's not just about reducing consumption; it's about finding more renewable. Uh, sources of energy as well. I mean, we've talked about this in a previous episode as well. Are we moving towards a more renewable future? Is it too little or too late? Well, I think there's no, there's no other way. Uh, we, mm. will, we will do finally. There will be some moment that we will get like a nuclear uh, fusion as a really big and clean source of energy. The, the other uh, solar, uh, wind and uh, and uh, conventional nuclear energies uh, are uh, improving too, are, are getting more modern, are giving um, much more power. 
So I think that's the that's the future, and uh, the industry and the politicians should uh, just take measures in advance and, and try to change as soon as possible. I think once the big energy companies find a reason to change, that's mm. when real. Unfortunately, that's the only time when real change will happen when they run out of oil to drill, or if they, you know, if, if shale gas doesn't, see, you know, it proves not to be as, as lucrative or too, you know, not cost effective enough. Uh, it'll be when these major economic, you know, these. It'll be when these major conglomerates actually start investing in renewable energies. Mm. There's no sign of that happening right now, yeah. but I think that's unfortunately when change will happen. You know, renewable energy and developing it is an expensive procedure, so I think governments do need to step in at this point um, and adhere to those international agreements if we're ever to make any sort of headway in this climate change issue. All right, shall we wrap up the first half of our episode then? Um, do we have any headlines on climate change? I can say a headline, I would say, the climate is in crisis, it's time to act. It's time to act indeed. Climate change, let's act before it's too late. On to a very different topic now. Have any of you played golf since coming to Korea? Absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> or anywhere else for that matter. Steven. Yeah, I didn't play it uh, since I was born. So. A resounding no from our <laughs> <laughs> well, as you may know, Korean female golfers in particular uh, have long been considered the world's greatest. They've won numerous championships, they've brought great honour not only to themselves, uh, but they've helped to boost Korea's national brand and promote uh, the country's local golf industry. There's been some great news about Korean ladies golf this year as well, so let's take a look at this news. Ladies golf in Korea has undergone a major renaissance and the proof lies in their annual earnings. The 2015 LPGA Tour Money list placed four Korean players in the top 10. Park in -bi came in second with more than $2.6 million in earnings. Kim Se-young, a three-time rookie winner, secured fourth place with $1.8 million. And Amy Yang in sixth place earned almost one and a half million dollars, while Liu Soyan came eighth with a little under 1.3 million dollars. Out of the 31 LPGA events that have taken place so far this year, 15 were won by South Korean players. So some big victories for Korean female golfers. In 2015, Pagin B picked up five victories, including two major championships, the Korea Grand Slam and a stint at World Number One as well. She's now eligible for the LPGA Hall of Fame. So congratulations to her. I think it's safe to say Korean female golfers have successfully dominated the field of golf. Uh, but from a foreign media point of view, what would you say the secret or the key to their success is? I guess there are, there are many uh, <laughs> there are many keys of their success, but one of them is the discipline that uh, Koreans have in any uh, part of life, just because mm -hmm. of their culture, discipline and, and competition. Yeah. As Korean children are like studying really, really hard to get a goal, uh, maybe a golfer of any other country would just play for fun and if, if they are good they would go professional or whatever. But in Korea they would learn to be professional since they are children with mm -hmm. a really high uh, levels of hard working and discipline. So maybe uh, they have more chances to, to get professional and to get better. Okay. I think discipline is very important in a, in a sport like golf where precision and like, mm. you know, a, a very small difference in your swing can, can make a big difference in your results. But I, I also think that in Korea there's this strong desire for excellence of like being great at something, particularly okay. being great at something that involves a lot of money and prestige like golf. I mean, uh, I, I don't see Korea producing any of the best, you know, street ball basketball players in the world. But <laughs> <laughs> well, hip hop uh, yeah, or um, like. Well, that's also a big dancing. money business, you know. Mm. Like Stephen, I think that um, golf satisfies some domestic as well as global objectives of South Korea. One, it's a it's a very prestigious sport, and it uh, it's seen as the the sport of the elite and wealthy, and it mm -hmm. only can enhance a family social status to have a pro golfer. Uh, amongst their ranks. Uh, but also there's a lot of sports nationalism. I think Korean golfers, as well as many other athletes, want their nation to dominate one particular sport. And I think golf is, is satisfying that, that desire. 
Actually, I, I was reading this article about The Economist that uh, asked this question, why are Korean women, uh, female golfers dominating the, the sport? And he came up with a lot of different reasons. He mentioned a highly competitive society and something you already mentioned. And one uh, possible explanation was pretty funny. He said, oh, the, it's a very small country, so they don't have a lot of space, so they have to spend a lot of time in practice. You know, you see, it's true, you see golf practice everywhere mm -hmm. in Korea. And it's supposed to be good because you have to repeat the same gesture, right. the same swing over and over and over. So that how, that's how you improve. I don't know if that's, uh, I'm not a golfer. I don't know if it's true or not, but I. <laughs> So there seems to be quite a range of reasons uh, for this top talent coming from Korea. The culture has something to do with it, the trends in the market as well. You see a lot of indoor golf places, um, but also Koreans do like to follow trends as well. So I imagine that if you see a number of successful yeah. golfers on screen, you think, oh, I could do that. That's yeah, something like for me. Kim Yeon Na in ice skating. I imagine there's a lot, of, a lot of young kids that, yeah. in training right now. Um, but while Korean female golfers are making their families and their countries proud, uh, the sport has been used to facilitate corruption as well, especially amongst public officials. Um, a number of politicians have been embroiled in scandals involving golf, uh, often mixing bribery with the sport. There was also the case of a Korean politician who caused controversy for playing golf during a business trip. Um, so many people have called for restrictions on politicians and how and when they play golf. Do you agree with this? And if so, what kind of restrictions should there be in place? Well, I mean, as long as they're doing something that's legal and they're using their own money. I mean, mm -hmm. of course, there are always scandals, I mean, in, in any country where a public official uses public money for their own private enjoyment or something. So, right. you know, that's wrong. If your local, like, Gu Jong or something is playing a round of golf and he's putting it on taxpayers, then that's not okay, but mm. I mean, if they're spending their own money and it's it's a legal activity, I don't think we can really say that they can't. Do yeah, it. I mean, otherwise, like if you look at China, that the Beijing has really restricted uh, golf in the country. There was a great book that came out last year called The Forbidden Game, okay. uh, and just uh, that talks that follows a few people involved in the, in the golf business in in China, where you have many golf courses that are technically illegal and have been banned because of the corruption associated with it. it it's it's really amazing to see the lengths that the, uh, the Chinese Communist Party goes uh, to prevent this sport uh, in the country. All right, well, golf is becoming more popular these days, especially as it becomes more affordable. You have more screen golf, uh, golf yeah, equipment is becoming cheaper as well. But it is still seen not only in Korea, but around the world, as Jason said, as a bit of an elitist sport. Uh, so what kind of efforts do you think we need to change perceptions of golf and make it more accessible to everybody and promote careers and the world's local golf culture. I, I was just, to take off on, on what Ata said, I think if we're going to promote sports, we should promote team sports. We should promote sports that like put young people in a situation where they can make friends and they can uh, learn to work as a team. You know, mm -hmm. like you, you learn a lot of valuable lessons when at a young age you have to cooperate with other people and yeah. you have to like manage all of your egos and you have to manage like each of your desire for glory, you have to balance within the framework of a team. And mm -hmm. I, I think there's a lot of like uh, valuable experience that comes from that. So if we're going to promote a sport, let's promote a team sport where a bunch of kids get somewhere where it's not that expensive mm -hmm. and their objective is to like put a ball in a net somehow. You know, that, that's the kind of sport I, I would want to get behind. Gentlemen and Su Jung, I think there's one alternative for everyone to be satisfied with, and that would be mini golf. <laughs> you have the aesthetics <laughs> of golf. Uh, you have it's it's considerably cheaper. Uh, I mean. I've always enjoyed hitting a ball into a, a windmill yeah, or a pirate ship. <laughs> um, I think it takes up less space. There's less environmental impact. Uh, it could be a team sport. Uh, so yeah, I think mini golf is our solution. I vote for you. I'm totally in favor of mini golf too. <laughs> So a new sport to promote. <laughs> so golf may not be the easiest sport to promote, but I think perceptions are changing and let's hope they continue to change, especially within Korea and um, make it more accessible to the general public as well. And best of luck to all our Korean golfers this year, male and female. Shall we wrap up with our final headlines on golf in South Korea? Sure. Um, I think my headline could have been written by Atta. I would say uh, Korean, women, Korean women are not only beautiful, but they are very good golfers as well. Okay, okay.
I totally agree. <laughs> <laughs> Mini golf for the impoverished masses. <laughs> <laughs> Slightly different perspective <laughs> from Jason there. Well, thank you for your insights on two very different but interesting topics nonetheless. Hope you enjoyed the show. We did. Good stuff. And I can't wait to see you next week with two more topics. Join us next week, viewers, for a whole new global talk show, News Tellers. We will be open for any opinions or requests on our official website as well as our Facebook page. Seoul is one of the major cities in the world, it's highly populated, but it's not as polluted as Beijing or other cities in the world that they, are, they could be, uh, be considered similar to Seoul. I, mean, I think considering Seoul's population, it's quite clean. Yeah, the, the Han River is much cleaner than it used to be, the park spaces are, are greener, like you know, Seoul's come a long way in the past decade or so. And what's interesting about Seoul, it's, it's not a magic bullet solution, it's a lot of small initiative, mm -hmm. it's a lot of like work of raising awareness, convincing people.